On this episode of Building Men, removing barriers with our words, actions, our thoughts, character, and heart. Conversation with one of my good friends, Dr. Mikey Fallon. Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Meralda. Last time you focused on self-care and the holistic health of your body. GM Revolution is a men's skincare line with a mission to introduce men to proper skin health. GM Revolution offers five skincare products that act as one to give men exactly what their skin needs. Whether you struggle with acne or you're looking to prevent fine lines, GM Revolution works hard to strengthen your body's largest organ, the skin to fight as your body's first line of defense against your environment. Using code BUILDINGMEN, one word, you can save 15% on all of GM Revolution's products and start seeing the physical and mental benefits of skin care. GM Revolution encourages you to be the revolution in your own life. Now, back to the Building Men podcast. Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. My name is Dennis Moral. The Building Men is geared toward helping you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. I'm joined today by a, another repeating guest. My brother's a repeating guest. I've, I've, I've had Anthony on a couple times, and I'm joined today by Mikey Fallon. Dr. Mikey Fallon is a uh, national, international performer, presenter, philosopher, poet, um, and just an all-around good dude who now is one of my really close friends over the last few months. So welcome, Mikey Fallon, to the Building Men Podcast, my man. Ah, great to be back, Dennis, really. I'm glad. Like, I just love – I love this – and I said this to you in, in the past, being able to say yes more to a lot of things that I think are really cool. But in the pre-pandemic, I wouldn't have been able to say yes, you know. So, like, this part, love it. Yeah, love to be we, back. We, you were try you tra- you travel all over the world pretty much, and yeah. that's one thing that's happened through the pandemic is it's opened up so many different opportunities for people that have had to reinvent themselves. Me being one of those people, I had to definitely reinvent what I was doing, and you did the same thing. So a little bit about what you're doing right now. Tell the tell the audience a little bit about what you do, um, and maybe how we got to know each other. Yeah, so I I put on one person. I would call it, I wouldn't even say a hodgepodge, but it's definitely multi-layered with acting and psychology and poetry and reflections. And I take all these parts of myself and I try to present a journey towards an audience that is never necessarily, it's never a place where they know exactly where it's going to next because sometimes I don't know where it's going to next. And so creating that has been an awesome, awesome experience. And then like during the pandemic, a lot of it or most of it has been now virtually. And at first I hated the fact that it was going to be virtual. And then doing it virtually, I started to realize some things that I didn't foresee. I I didn't realize that people would feel more intimacy in a virtual presentation than they did when I'm on stage. Like somehow my thought of the live audience would transcend anything that can happen on a screen. But in this format, I feel that people get to see me in a way that's just a little bit different than if they're seeing me on stage. Right. And you think about it, if you're if you're on stage and there's a couple thousand people around, whatever the case may be, not only are you, your proximity you know, near the people that you're presenting to, but also there's a lot of other distractions. You know, as you're sitting presenting the, you know, the background, you know, maybe the girl next to you, mm-hmm. the, you know, the nice body, you're kind of checking her out or something like that at the same time, whatever it might be if you're, yeah. if you're a student watching. But when you're in someone's space, you're in their living room, you're you're on their screen. Now they're totally dialed into everything that's going on. Plus, they get to see your emotion. And a lot of what you're doing is you're you become these characters and the emotion that you feel. It's so it's so trans like it's you you have this transparency like this is me and i'm this character right now right yeah and that's the other part right so just to think that i think part of what my brain got stuck on was how am i going to speak to a bunch of people now when i don't see most of them and all i'm really looking at is my camera on my screen and then i i realized that i take this work so seriously 
that I and I and I knew I took it seriously, but I didn't realize that to the point where I felt like that late night uh, rate to have a radio DJ on there and saying, hey, call in, tell me about your song you want to you want to dedicate. And just the intimacy of listening to people share. I remember growing up, listening to people share these very personal stories um, because they couldn't be seen. And me doing this virtual presentation, I feel like that I am that DJ talking just to that one person. And people have walked away saying, you were just as powerful, if not more powerful in this setting. I did not anticipate that. And there's so much there having that. It almost feels like you're talking to them specifically. Right. I mean, you're talking to so many people, but it's like you're having that level of connection. And that's something that a lot of kids have lost during the last you know year or so is that connection that intimate connection with people and so you're able to fill that need for them i did a lot of research on just the the dynamics around the virtual learning space a lot of what i do is teaching people how to operate in this space how to engage how to build community how do you manage like a classroom or behaviors in a, in a virtual space but one thing that was really interesting i'm, I'm curious to know how you think about this is one, the idea of that screen fatigue. I mean, I know with me, my, my vision was always really, really good. And now I have these like reading glasses because I'm like, my eyes are have gotten shot from staring at the screen for a long time. But the other thing yeah. that I recognize that happens is kids are, they're staring at themselves in the screen a, a lot as well. So when you think about our, especially kids, so you put yourself back into a, you know, elementary, middle, high school spot where body image, self-image is, is mm-hmm. such a big thing of how you how you see yourself as how you think other people see you. And now you're constantly staring back at yourself on the screen. I think that might have done some damage to kids as well, constantly seeing themselves like, oh man, and kids would have their cameras off and things like that. Yes. Uh, just based on that like constant mi- mirror. Well, forget just the kids, it's done damage to me. Like I was in one show where <clears throat> I get on and it was a virtual presentation and I'm doing my characters. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh man, this student forgot to mute themselves, except they didn't forget. The school just didn't do a good job at saying, you know, we're, we're giving only the permission of unmuting yourself to the host and the co-host. So it became the wild west where she then started ripping me apart. Like, who's this big head, bald, you know, N word, N word, N word, you know, going on like this, you know? And I was just like, wow, you know? And I, and I knew it was a tough school district. I knew that part, but then I could see on the screen that there were some parents with their children watching this presentation oh, wow. and the awkwardness of how do I, what do I tell my kid right now? You know, uh, and, but, and, and the problem was the administrator who brought me in He's like, okay, Mikey, uh, just give me a, a couple minutes here just to get that student off. And he's pressing whatever he's pressing. He can't figure it out. So then she's like, look at you, you old person. You can't figure it out. Oh, you mother effer, blah, blah, blah. Just like going off. And so here I am. And now, I mean, I could tell you, and I, and I, and I actually shared this with those students there, that sometimes I'll come onto screen and I will ask myself is my head too big you know like like literally it's affected me and my self-confidence because what it did was trigger me back to when i was in elementary school and being made fun of because walking with my head up in a way that people were like why do you walk with your head backwards like that well you know and always picking apart anything that i felt that i didn't feel about myself until they criticized it is that amazing it's funny i did I did this 12 week online program. Uh, I called it the rebuild program. And it was helping people that had had gone through something challenging in their life that were trying to kind of pick up the pieces, so to speak. And I would do a weekly video. And then once a week, I'd also do a live video, whatever the thing was, we talk about accountability, intentional discomfort, um, you know, our mindset, whatever it was. So there was 12 different videos that I would post. And the live video I would do, just whatever. I was in the middle of my house, I would be doing something and I would post a live about whatever the topic was. Two minute thing, a challenge that people had to do. And so the one video as I'm talking, a little chunk of spit 
goes right into the middle of my lip and I'm still in the middle of talking and now it's there. I don't realize it. Right. Right. I'm right. Going through this video <laughs> and it was, I mean, I thought I did a good job with it by the end of it. I'm like, man, that was really motivational. And I post it within like three minutes. Some dude is like, yeah, that was really motivational. What about that huge fucking hunk of spit that was on your <laughs> lip? You're going to finish eating that right now. I was like, God damn it. It's unbelievable. Oh, that's the worst. Oh, that is, that is, yeah. But, <laughs> but that virtual part, just just how, so on, the, on one hand, right, so that was like a negative sort of side yeah. story. On the flip side of that, I've realized that some students that never would have participated in a, in a large group setting and in front of their peers feel more comfortable because they're in their home or their space alone where they don't get to watch people's reaction snickering that same way. And so they will ask a question. And then like one of my better presentations this year, since the virtual presentation was at a school last week for, or last week, I think it was for um, young teens that have special needs and, uh, and they all have disabilities. And these kids were, they were jumping up, coming to the screen, pressing unmute so they can ask a question. And some of them were just like these really profound ways of seeing the world and sharing that. Other ones, it was this combination of all the adult noise they've been hearing in their lives. Right. You're supposed to treat someone good and someone better because, uh, well, the Bible said it. And if you don't, you're going to hell. <laughs> You know, so there I am. I'm listening to all of this, this level of how it makes people feel comfortable and uncomfortable, you know, and I, I do speeches all the time. But if someone starts attacking my these vulnerable parts where I may just feel insecure, it can I can take it too seriously. And it's also given people an opportunity to see below the surface level like giving about an iceberg and how much we see of students say mm. the of people it's you know we can maybe see their gender maybe maybe not um a little bit about their ethnicity you know some physical characteristics um there might be some things that we can just visually see a lot of the stuff happens below the surface that we have no idea it's going on things that, it, that are internal um but what this has done as well is we have gotten a deeper look into things that are going on in people's lives that are happening yes. behind their cameras or behind their screens that we're like, wow, I can't believe this kid is going through whatever that may be. And it's given educators, I believe, an insight into some of the struggles that kids have on a regular basis. Right. Right. Yeah. No. And that's the, that's, the, that's the other part where I had to pull back a little bit in the virtual presentation of how intense on making these presentations. Um, not that it doesn't have its natural intensity because of the topics I talk about. However, realizing that if a kid is home and I'm talking too much about my own past suicidal stuff and and this this person is getting triggered by that, last thing I need is a person just being, you know, by themselves at home and feeling no connection to anyone else. And that isolation just increasing to a real dangerous place. When I had you in as um, a performer, as a, when I was a principal and I would bring you into the schools where I held a leadership position to do presentations for the students, you would do two presentations. There was a presentation for the fifth and sixth grade, and that was um, even small crayons make right. bright marks. Right on, right on, yep. And then the other one was you don't know me till you know me, and that was for the seventh and eighth grade, especially the second presentation i remember we had to be all hands on deck after mm -hmm. the presentation the following morning and i always had some type of an advisory program in my school where there was this 20 or 30 minute spot to start the day that was around building community around you know helping breaking down barriers and helping kids with self-confidence i always just believed in that spot during the day yeah but i would always tell the teachers the day after you did the presentation be ready. One, we always had something that was like a, a conversation spark or conversation starter around things that they learned. But a lot of that, a lot of the things that would happen with the kids would kind of get in touch with a lot of the emotionality that they pushed down. After your presentation, it would come kind of bubbling up to the surface. Yeah. And we needed our professionals to be ready to handle those conversations with the kids after your presentations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and that's, that's been a bigger juggle now virtually because 
the teachers are just stretched beyond thin. I mean, they, they are now just on the minimal extra energy I can provide as to what I can do. But, but it's been, a, you know, that's sort of been a challenge as well, where, so I, I, I learned how to adapt even in this format. How can I get people reflecting, entertained, you know, feeling a little bit, maybe touched sad a little bit, but certainly bringing them back up with, you know, positive story that really they walk away feeling like, okay, good. I feel really better now. You know, you mentioned before about the girl calling you big head yeah. or whatever. And it, you probably initially you went back into a spot in your life, you know, where that was yeah. your reality. And so in the one presentation that even small crayons make bright marks, Talk to us a little bit about how you weave that thought into your presentation. You know, the idea where it's not sticks and stones may break your bones, names will never hurt you. That's right. bullshit. We know that now. We know that right. that those things can have this deep impact on students pervasively as they get older. Yeah, yeah. So with the the younger version show that I do, you know, I start with even if something because one of the things that becomes a little bit like everyone can agree, like, OK, this is a horrible thing to say to someone. Don't make fun of them. Don't call them big head. Don't, don't tease their body, their looks. But what if it's funny, right? So the one character there that says the name that he nicknamed his principal is Mr. Bubble Butt because his butt is so big. It's like a huge poopy butt, you know? And so like, and then, you know, everyone's laughing at that, you know? And sometimes, especially when they're younger, like around the third and fourth graders, I'll say, now, how many of you think that the principal would really enjoy that that was his nickname? And they're all like, no, right? But I said, but it still made you laugh, right? And so it can, it can be funny, but how do we use the humor, not in a way to make other people feel bad about like who they are or themselves? And I also talk about just like my prank calling days. Like, you know, I've made prank calls left and right. I love making prank oh, calls, yeah. you know? And I, and, and I loved making those prank calls that either made people feel very embarrassed or stupid. And, and uh, that was enjoyable to me until, you know, it got so serious where I didn't care what emotion the other person was feeling, except the emotion that I wanted them to feel. So I would call nursing homes and pretend that I was somebody's grandchild because they would think that's who it is. And then I take them on this long journey and and saying that I, I'm, I'm lost. Can you help me? And, you know, these grandparents are probably freaked out, like right. getting all this work. But in a sixth grade mind, that's just funny. You know, so I use these stories as a way to to shape. Hey, how can we be? you're going to do those silly things. You're going to go, you're going to do those things just to get the laugh, but how can you step back sometimes and say, is this my better self? Yeah. And your characters are very well developed. And what do you have like seven or eight different characters that you use over the shows? Yeah. But I mean, total, probably I probably have over like 25, you okay. know, different ones as through the years. Yep. Yep. How much of those characters are little pieces of you and how many of those characters are just ones you're like, wow, I really need this to have a character that speaks to this audience? Yeah. So there are three ways. One is that characters that are pieces of me or have pieces of me, uh, the second part, characters that I wish that I could have been a little bit. And then the third part of like that last part of like, yeah, I want to touch on this topic, but not in your linear traditional way you know so when i first created my football player who's gay like I, I didn't i didn't want to have a character that's coming out there being like hey you know right. and everyone be laughing and oh this is a gay person you know but even with that and i intentionally so when i do my football player and then the character after is the is a guy in a hoodie who's more you know, through the years, he's transitioned from um, the the goth kid, the emo kids, you know, like those, that's where he's transitioned. And then, you know, so I do that character. And then the next character in on the stage performance would be Sabine, uh, my female character. And, but it's so fascinating. People are so obsessed 
with the gay character that they're spending so much time because a football player, well, this guy looks muscular. He probably played football. You know, is he really gay? And they're stuck on this like question of like, am I Mikey Fowlin gay? And so they're, they're watching the show, but they still haven't answered that. So when I get to the female character, certain schools, they'll be like, Looking at each other. Oh, yeah. See, I told you he's gay. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. right there. Yep. He has to be, you know, <laughs> just like, <laughs> like, really? Are you that stuck? You know? And and for years, kids, in the question and answers, kids would ask right right up front. So I'm just wondering, your character, um, is that you? Are you really gay? And and I and I'd say, and I sometimes joke around. Sometimes I wouldn't answer and just be like, would it matter? I just say, would it matter if I am or not in what you're understanding from the character? Or I would say, no, I'm not gay, but my boyfriend is, you know. So I like <laughs> either say one of the two. Right? right. So, but but I realized the time has changed that when I do that character now, it's less shocking than it was when I first started doing that character. And so like sometimes we get stuck on how much how much further we have to go in healing and understanding each other but we don't give enough credit of how far we've come either like i've been doing this long enough to say wow there are distinct changes in audiences now absolutely i think back to how i would have taken in your presentation as a seventh grader in 1991 yep or whatever yep. how that would have how i would have reacted how the cultural norms would have been if you were on stage becoming this character and there was a gay, there probably was the same percentage of students in the school that were gay that just had no outlet and it yes. wasn't socially acceptable. And now it's just become more part of, of culture that that's just something that I know with my own kids, they don't bat an eyelash at. They, they wouldn't think twice about anything like that. No. But we would have in school. Yes. Yes. Like, Are you kidding me? Yeah. Or the whisper, like he's yep. gay, yep. you know, she's gay, you know, and it's fascinating that, and we're fortunate being in the Northeast corridor. Uh, there are other places in the United States where it's the same, but I have been to places in the general time frame that if I either asked me not to do that character or to have that character have some other thing that in their story, you know, that they, they didn't want that. I remember I was in Arkansas and they were like, cause if, if you get up there and you start saying this character's gay, I'm going to get on stage. I'm going to cut the show off right then. So that character has to have a second head protruding from his shoulder and begin. Right. <laughs> right. So, so well, well, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So that, so this, cause this principal said that to me and I was just like, I was like, you realize I can't just remove a character without Every, the, my whole message being ruined, you know, I said, really, each character or place because of what they're trying to convey and to silence this character, like, it, it, you know, I'd have to, he's like, well, if you're going to do it, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to stop the show. I said, what do you want me to do? I said, you want me to just pre pretend he has leprosy, you know, and, and the principal, no joke, goes, that's leprosy. That's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I was like, wow. So my workaround when, it, when that had happened, my workaround was, okay, you know what? I'll abide by this because there are enough students in here that need to hear my, the message, the entire message. And when I got to the football player, I, um, I just said, you know, I'm, I've been asked not to do this character and I'm not allowed to get into it, but um, this character has been silenced and reflects all the kids in this school that perhaps have been silenced as well. Wow. So for five minutes, I'm just going to stand here in silence and has held up the wow. jersey. Just stood wow. there, stood there in complete silence, <laughs> you know? And so, and then I just went on with the show, you know? And uh, yeah, but it was a powerful moment and he was pissed. Like he was, <laughs> I said, I didn't mention it. <laughs> exactly. And yep. here's the thing. Those kids were probably so intrigued by that character. They probably went and looked up the other shows and tried to <laughs> right, figure right. out. And so what he did was he empowered the message even more than he thought he was by trying to silence you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. Over the last couple uh, episodes that I've done, I started to go down this this rabbit hole of just education in general. And we work in a space where we're working with schools 
and it's almost like the emperor's new clothes or yeah. the, whatever it is like I, what i started to do recently mikey is things that during my time as an administrator that just sat with me in the wrong way and i wasn't quite sure why or maybe i didn't feel like i had the voice to do it or maybe i wasn't courageous enough courageous enough to start speaking out against i started to realize there are so many issues with the way that mm. schools are inherently run, that's a perfect example. That's a perfect yeah. example. And I really started to do this deep dive into what I would do to change schools and what lessons should be taught in schools. When you think about the curriculum from kindergarten through 12th grade and the things that the, the specific state you know, legislature say that we have to teach and then the local school boards of education tell us we have to teach, what are the things that we should be teaching to kids in school? What are the life lessons that kids should come out with after their journey in school? Mm, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? What, yeah. what do you say are a couple of the big life lessons that we should come out with? Well, the ability to take what you're processing in a classroom and to apply it beyond just what it was meant for, right? So when I use in, in my presentations about the first grade lesson of crossing things out that didn't belong and didn't fit, you know, like there was no message attached to that and to say to the kids like, hey, we actually do this to each other later on, you know, and, and you know, first of all, the teachers aren't cognizant of what that could be interpreted, but sometimes looking at like, we, why are you learning this? What is it really going to help you and be useful for you down the road or in your life or interacting with your friends. And I think sometimes that's where education falls short because we're stuck with the tradition of how we learn that everyone's supposed to learn in this way. I, I was actually trying to help my cousin whose son is brilliant, but brilliant on the more visual art, and like poetry level when it comes to traditional academics yeah he gets frustrated he has all this emotion that it, it and he's in fourth grade and it just butts heads with the teachers and and he's and he's a lot to handle when it when it because he's frustrated he doesn't know how to express that except if you give him a pen or a pencil and to write a poem. I mean, he's writing stuff that when she read me one of his more recent poems, I was like, stop lying, stop lying. That's, that's, uh, where's the poet I can find this book in, in Barnes and Noble, you know, like it, he is beyond his level of, in his art, visual art, but then the traditional mathematics and other subjects, he's at a loss, you know, and we don't have schools. When you get to middle school, some middle schools and the private school rec, um, in the vector of those private schools, but definitely in the high schools, you can have those high schools that are focused on the arts and how people learn. But elementary, we want everyone to learn the same way. And I just think there's a, there's an injustice to a kid like my, you know, my cousin Tamayo, you know, and that. Uh, so I think how can we, the lessons be taught? Cause I was not, I was not a very traditional learner. And it cost me problems with some teachers because they couldn't follow how I would like solve like a math problem. And I saw it for the way I saw it. And I was really good at math, but I couldn't like giving me those steps. I was always trying to figure out, oh man, maybe there's some other way to do this, you know? And that was just like my artistic creativity going into this. And, but it wasn't rewarded. It wasn't something that I felt like, oh, wow, that's a really great way to figure this out. It was like, nope, you didn't do the traditional way. And the people that I've spoke, spoken to over the last couple of weeks, none of them learn the traditional way. Every single mm. one of them would have been students that were in my office as a principal that would have gotten kicked out because of they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They weren't kind of coloring within the lines yeah. where they were pushing back in a spot where they saw some level of injustice going on or maybe just pushing back at the teacher in regards to how things were, were taught. And what I've recognized is each one of these men that I've spoken to, while they didn't go through school the traditional way, they maybe they didn't get good grades. Some of them went to college, dropped out of college, or didn't even go to college. They were like, I learned how to learn the way that my brain was telling me I was supposed to. And I also learned how to pick myself up when things didn't go my way. Yeah. And I think too frequently what we do is we solve problems for kids 
as educators, as parents, we come in and we say, okay, here's how you do it. Let me, let me do it for you. And there's so much learning that doesn't happen because we fix it for them. We don't give them an opportunity yeah. to fix it for themselves. Yes. Yes. There is that part too, that there is a way that for me, um, failure is looked at upon differently because I was never able to fit into whether it was group norms or even like scholastically trying to rationalize and understand certain things. So there was a way that it made me a lot more resourceful. Right. So there's, uh, I'm, I'm constantly like, okay, I'm not really stuck right now. I'm sure I can fit the belief that I can figure this out. You know, I already, and I remember in college when I would take, before I take exams, I would convince myself and it wasn't just something I would say, but I'd convince myself that there is nothing that a professor can ask me that I don't already know. I just have to remember it, you know, and I truly went into exams with that mindset, like, no, I just have to remember that I know this, you know, and that, that helped so much. One thing that we talked about just in our we have weekly Zoom meetings. We'll get back. We'll get into that towards the end of the episode. Uh, but you and I have had weekly Zoom meetings since the beginning of the December on the project that we're working on. And you talked to, to me and to Mark about one of your mentors. And he talked about, you know, as people get towards the twilight of their lives, that there were these three things that they wish that they had done or advice that they might give. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm putting you on the spot right here because I've, I've quoted this in a couple different spots. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I have it the right way because you were the one that told me about that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about who this was, your relationship with him and what those things were? Yeah. So this man is named Tony Campolo and he, he was a professor at uh, Eastern college in Pennsylvania. And I remember seeing a videotape, a VHS tape when I was in college of this guy giving this sermon. And uh, so he's like part professor, part spiritual advisor, part evangelist, and has all this stuff. But he's an amazing storyteller. And he, he has that gift that I admired when I was young. And I always knew, like, that's what I want to do. I want to see something, sort of put it out to people. And then to show what I'm adding to this. And so he talked about this because he's a sociologist by trade. And he said, you know, there's a, this sociological survey that was given to 50 people over the age of 95. And they were asked only one question. If you had your lives to live over, what would you do differently about how you lived your lives? And he said there was like a multitude of answers, but three answers kept surfacing to the top. And then they said, number one, they would reflect more. And all it meant was they would take those times that they lived most of their lives of just pure existence and never fully living. But they realized if they really just reflected, they would have taken in the moments of all the years they were alive, as opposed to just going through routines. And the second thing he said is that they would risk more. And these elderly people basically said, the stuff we thought that was so risky, we were worried about investing or this, Looked at it back later, like, that nah, wasn't that risky. And the stuff that we thought were real risk-taking behaviors, they weren't that risky either. And it was just this way of, like, they would take more of those risks because they said, ultimately, you look back in your life and you realize this is what part of what life is about. But the third thing they said is that they would do more things that would live on after they were dead. And uh, that, that part of embracing our lives... I like to think about it in terms of what do you want to be said about you at your funeral? You know, what, what will people say? I'm hoping that it's not going to be, he made lots of money, you know, somebody can, or, or even like just taking care of myself physically. I don't want to ever make that the prime of what people see about me, social media or anything else, because ultimately if you're dead, well, it didn't work the best, you know, so, <laughs> right? It's this idea that I still want to look good. So I hope no one's standing around like, whoa, the great physical shape. Like, it's not that important, but to do more things where people are saying, you know, this person on a day that I was feeling really down made me feel like I can stay. I can really uh, embrace. And, and Tony Campolo shared a story of one of his teacher friends 
who, um, you know, who used to take pride in marking this one student, they couldn't stand his papers wrong. Like, like if he failed, should put a big F on top of it and be a red marker. And, um, and then so one day the student came in class and, and gave the teacher as a gift, gave her like these like flowers and some perfume that was half used up. And the teacher felt obligated. I'm going to spray some of this. And, and then, you know, the kid was so happy. He was just like, those flowers look beautiful. And, and, and that perfume, that was my mother's perfume. And you smelled just like her as mom had passed away. And he's like, uh, and then she realized in that moment, like, wow, I got to be a better person as his teacher. And, and she started spending time with him. And, the, you know, the long story, the short story of it is that he went on later to become a teacher because of this woman, yeah. you know, like changing that and doing more things that will live on after we're dead. Yeah. When I told that story, I butchered the beginning of it a little bit. <clears throat> I was saying it was about the relationships and kind of being in the moment with those um, but you saying it's reflection that it's, it's so, it's such a deeper way to think about it, to, to be present in all of those moments mm -hmm. in your life. Right. When you think about, you know, the, those moments every single day that are just those throwaway moments that you don't recognize, like, you know, I'm, I'm able to look out my back door and see these beautiful trees and birds in the sunshine, you know, and some people don't have that because they don't have their sight or whatever it is, but just yeah. appreciating, reflecting on that present moment and being there. And then also I talked about it. I got emotional talking about this on an interview recently, um, thinking about those, the, the last time that something happens in your life. You know, it's really easy to recognize the first moments that, you know, you, you're, you, you when you first drive, you, your first home run, the first time you kiss a girl, your kids' yep. first words, your, but it's the last time that something happens that I think, especially as men, we don't think of those <clears> things. We don't say, okay, this, this could be the last time that, and I, I got choked up when I was talking about the last time uh, my daughter sits on my lap. Yeah. And hugs me. You know, like you don't, you don't know that. So it's like fully appreciate all those little moments because it could be the last time that that situation happens. Yeah. That gets me every, every single fucking time that I start. <laughs> talking about it. No. I, and, and likewise, I have asked people this and this makes people feel very uncomfortable. Um, and I'll say to people, not in a depressing way though. I wonder if I've already lived the best day of my life. You know, like at some point you're going to live the best day of your life and there's not going to be a day that seems to surpass that day. Right. And let's hope it's not. It wasn't back in the high school halls, you know, and then all those rest of the years, you're sort of going through it. But, you know, I know for some people they're like, no, of course, there's going to be other be other. Be I said, no, not necessarily. I don't even mean it as a bad thing. I just mean that, you know, if, you, if somebody who's gotten diagnosed with some terminal illness and the rest is like they're they're feeling themselves just sort of waste away well they certainly have a time when it was already the best day of their lives right and they and they sort of feel that and experience that um and so but just that it's the same pause of let's just be a little more cognizant that we don't we can't just throw this away you know like i i have a hip surgery coming up june 18th and i've been consciously not saying I can't wait until June 18th, because if I'm moving that far ahead, I'm also missing what's already happening. Okay? And I may not be here June 18th, you know, I, 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 I'm planning to be, but I may not be right. So what if, what does it say about all these other days that are happening right. that I just need to embrace? You know, One thing I love about you is that you aren't afraid to tackle those uncomfortable conversations with people that bristle up against a lot of people um, that some would shy away from having that discussion with someone, people's reactions are going to be, what do you mean? My best days are my best days definitely ahead of me or whatever the case, how dare you, but it's something that you have to really think about. And the other thing is you are really comfortable in just being open and honest about your battles with, you know, anxiety, depression, um, yeah. mental health. And it's something, you know, you, your doctorate is in helping people in those, in those 
parts of their life, but you're very open and honest about how you've dealt with it in your own life over the years. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I realized too, that I'm like some of it far more comfortable than other parts of it. So I'm more comfortable with my depression than I am with my anxiety. And, you know, I put myself into therapy more recently to work on some of like techniques to use when I'm feeling extremely anxious. And, um, and it's, there's some attachment that I have with anxiety that makes me feel back when I was a kid and not having friends or people being like, ew, I'm not going to shake your hand. It's all sweaty. And, and all this stuff that is, is attached to it. And that I still hold on to, even if I don't have the same physical sensations that I had then, it was still like anxiety is a weakness where my depression never felt like a weakness. It just felt like, yeah, you're going through a lot of stuff, you know, that's part of the results of depression, you know, but you know, where anxiety could be the same thing. It's just more that I had a hard time acknowledging that I was anxious as a person. Um, and until my dad's years ago said to me, Hey son, are you still as nervous as you were when you were a little, and I was for the first time, like I was nervous as a kid. I was nervous as a kid, you know, I was anxious as a kid, you know, my dad's word is nervous, but it's the anxiety that I felt, you know, that, that paralyzing shutdown feeling. And, and so I felt more recently comfortable talking about the anxiety, not only in dealing with my own, but in helping people feel comfortable just sharing theirs, you know, or talking about theirs. And just normalizing your battle with with both right. things, helping kids understand. Listen, um, you know we're going to be going through this these things. We're gonna we might deal with depression, we might deal with anxiety, um, those mental health things. But it's also what we talked about before with homosexuality and transgender. Those are things when we were growing up, it was challenging to to think about and to talk about. I think feel like the, it's the same thing with mental health now. I feel like it's a little bit yeah. it's become a little bit easier for us, especially as men, to understand this is how we're feeling and it's okay to reach out to someone for help. It's it's real easy to say, oh, I'm getting my hip replaced, you know, on such and such a day on June 18th. Right. So, you know, I'm going to, you know, a therapist about X, Y, and Z. For a long time, that would have been challenging to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even as a psychologist, right? There's this part of like, oh, well, if you don't have, you know, people's like, you know, they're not trying to be dismissive or to insult me, but people saying, oh, if you have to see a shrink, well, we're all screwed then, you know, you're so, you know, like that kind of way that it just, again, if you need to go to a, really a mental health doctor, then somehow it's worse than just going to a physical doctor or, or more stigma for sure. On it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we started working with, uh, with Mark Wiener, Dr. Mark Wiener, who is, a Mark is a psychologist. Um, Mark works in um, a therapeutic setting, and he also works for a professional sports team. And he helps them as they are looking to draft players. So he does psychological evaluations of prospective draft choices. So after the last time that I interviewed you, which is Building Men episode 21, I think it was beginning of November, November 4th or something like that, I want to say. So if anyone is listening, go back and check out that episode one. You'll get a deeper dive into, you know, me and Mikey and then also, um, you know, our journey for the last couple months as well. But after that episode, we started talking about your experience as a football player. And you were saying about being a running back and this epiphany you had about being hit and you went on this deep dive after that episode you're like i want to introduce you to my man mark and so yeah. we actually we got on a zoom call on december 2nd and we started just shooting the shit about hey let's talk about our collective journeys you know your journey as a you know a philosopher presenter your background in, in psychology uh, mark's background and then my background with schools social emotional learning community building and we started to kind of get some ideas together. And we actually presented at, at a national coaches conference in January around, we called it the map project. Right. And it was um, at the beginning, at first it was mindset, athleticism and performance. And we've, we've honed in on a little, a little bit mindset abilities and pathways now MAP, but we started to talk, talk about how as a coach, 
you have so, you play such an integral role in your your um, players, the, the players in the field or on the court or whatever, the way that you show up for them and how you can help them with their mindset and how that can translate into them being more successful on their, you know, with yeah. their respective teams. Um, so our journey now has initially was just, you know, me interviewing you for the podcast after we had known each other. Now our journeys have kind of come together and now we're, we're working together in this capacity. Right. And I think part of that through doing these, this podcast is that we were identifying, well, this whole theme of like, Hey, let's interview, you're interviewing different men from different walks of life and what they're contributing, what, you know, different quirks or interests they may have that you wouldn't see right away. What, where, what I realized too, is that as men, we're not often given the permission to show anything outside of sort of this, the masculine ideas of what a guy is supposed to be, you know? And, um, and I think it just betrays who we are as, you know, it, it betrays, it, there's something, there is something beautiful to see a guy like I, one of my friends from high school, so his wife had taken a picture of him when he's putting on his youngest daughter on the bus for the first time. And, you know, he, she, oh, she's taking a video and, you know, he has some tears and he's like wiping it away. But the comments after just like, oh, it was so beautiful to see you cry to allow yourself to cry and, and i get it right because it's like if if it was the mother doing that be like yeah it's always tough and yeah mom's gonna cry about um and and i think the you know the map project for us is trying to help young men uh, to not only be productive on the field or whatever or productive in whatever game they're playing but how can you embrace those other parts of yourself that's as much as your masculinity as your toughness, you know, your physical strength, you know, and, and how do you sort of live up to this best, your best mindset for this is going to be including all parts of you and not just sequestering them because now I'm on the football field. So now I can't look at anybody or, you know, or even like in baseball, you know, you have some pitchers. I'm always amazed because there are pitchers that when they're in game time, they don't want to talk to anyone. I get that. They focus. They want to be, be there for this game or if they're going through, um, you know, like a perfect game or they're going through a no hitter. Yeah. You stay away for you. You know, to stay away. But I love hearing David Cohn talk about when he threw his perfect game. He was so mad when he went into the dugout and no one would talk to him. Like he was like, I just want to have a conversation. I'm just, you know, and that helped him to be calm. But how, but that is the exception, right? To say, you know, like, okay, how can you be as ultra competitive, go for that, that thing that few people in the history of baseball have been able to do and still be completely you that's that's hard man <laughs> i mean i and that was it was back-to-back -back years i think it was wells and cones yeah 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 97 well 90 yeah 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 and so we we did that work for lawrence first and goal coaches clinic and a lot of it was just us going through this journey of understanding our own feelings around athletics, how we were coached, how we coached our kids or whatever. And we developed these kind of archetypes of athletes. So these different like levels that we perceived as different archetypes for athletes. The coolest thing happened though, during this journey. So we kind of, we were locked in on this, this athletes part of it, you know, how can right. we help male athletes, their coaches, be, you know, but what started to happen is as the more we talked and different opportunities started to open up, we're like, this idea is bigger than just athletics. You know, we can we can work with schools, we can work with organizations because your mindset is it's so important to how you show up in every single aspect. And so when you have, you know, a performer, you know, a, a doctor of, of psychology, you know, someone who works in more of a clinical setting, someone who worked with schools, the the kind of um, synergistic way that happened with the three of us, plus all the ball busting that goes on whenever we meet right. on, you know, whatever day it is. Right. <laughs> it's been such a such an unbelievable experience and a um, a worthwhile experience. One, getting to know the two of you on a deeper level, and then also seeing 
how needed this is in society to really understand how much you know we need to take care of our mental health yeah and it's it needs to be a part of any anytime you have a group of people in an organizational setting together you have to be considering these these things as we move forward in society right right and i think <clears throat> another area that we also have been more certainly more open to and seeing how this will play out is just the involvement and inclusion of uh, girls and young ladies, you know, who are also athletically competitive or whatever groups we're dealing with of to say, okay, are there themes that are consistent here that we are, we're playing, we're really talking about, you know, and, or even like I was thinking more recently, you know, what parts like male and female athletes are so segregated from experiencing each other in this, in the, in the competitive world that I, I like, I know some of the things that, you know, if um, a girl's softball team are like chat, how do how do they like horse around with each other? Like what's, what's that element? Like, you know, what are the stuff they have to put aside? That's maybe a little bit different than hanging out with their other girlfriends or hanging out with other women in there. That's not that as a guy and an athlete that is also done, you know, we do the same thing. You know, there's a way that when I was with football guys, there's a horsing around that happens that I didn't do so much in my youth group with the, the guys there, you know? So there's just a, you know, so like all those parts, but again, that hitting that part of that mindset part, you know, like what is your mindset is that's what, I mean, that's what the map project is really trying to um, hi, both highlight and as well as to access and people that just want to sort of leave it all at the door before, you know, going on the field there. My background besides education, I have a minor in sociology as well. So just, studying group behaviors is just fascinating to me yeah being on several teams growing up and then coaching teams as well there's definitely a group dynamic that exists i think it's one it's specific to that sport so there are some cultural or there's some norms within each sport that occur yes but then within each team every year there was a different vibe that happened based on who stepped up as a leader on the team and these goes this goes back into that archetype kind of thing like who is the the captain player on the team who's that warrior player who's the the one who's gonna fuck around and you know try to you know grab play grab ass every every time right. they get on a team but there's develops this um group kind of feel and it they're always communities whenever groups of people are together they're always yeah. communities that happen but there's always something unique about each one of those communities and when you're in a leadership position especially as a coach you have to really understand those group dynamics if you're going to get the best out of that group of young men or young women or whatever the case may be right, right. understanding what exists and then being able to use that to inspire them to be the best that they can be yeah 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 and knowing that you, you nailed it too when you said knowing that culture of whatever group you're doing the culture in a larger sense i mean not race you know the culture of personality styles all of that i watch my daughter's travel volleyball team and they are sometimes at their best when they're cranking up the rap music in between and they're just like dancing and that where for me when i was wrestling or football it's like i needed to be alone and almost like when i'm like when i'm in the gym i don't want to have conversations with anyone i'm just sort of like i'm ready to just grind you know and like so that was like that that sort of aggression works for me in my competitiveness on that level but uh there's something also really envious when i watch you know my daughter's volleyball team and they're they're still laughing even though they're losing and I can't, I can't put the two together. <laughs> I know with my own daughter for softball, I mean, the softball cheers are just notorious and I love it because one, you, you feel that community feel and, and how good they feel for each other. Yeah. But conversely, it, I could still hear it when I close my eyes It just, I could hear <laughs> it happen. And there it's almost, there's this battle that goes on who can be louder between the two teams. Oh yeah. Oh you yeah. You gotta make sure that you have Tylenol before you roll up to a softball tournament. No doubt. No doubt. Right. So like those parts too, are just like, 
but they're fascinating to me, right? That's like the, it's like, I'm sure when, you know, some women like watched guys who have to like, feel like they're going to punch a wall or slam their heads against each other. You know, it's like, Oh, okay. You know, that's, it must come off as a strange behavior for this thing too. Yeah. The other thing I just thought about, so as a college athlete, there was, I went through like hazing experience as well, Mm -hmm. where um, the hazing happened. It was your first year on the team. And we would take a a trip down to Florida. It was like our spring training. And the hazing was being squatted, quote unquote, squatted. And what it was, you would basically, you know, a group of juniors or seniors would pretty much like bust into the hotel room and they would hold you down. Like you would fight. They would fucking hold you down. And then the hairiest motherfucker on the team wouldn't wipe his ass and he would come and basically rub his ass all over your fucking face as you're fighting to get out and that was like the rite of passage for but it was it was hazing i mean that's what happened and 100 right and i you know there's there's worse things that happen as far as hazing is concerned and i remember i was gonna pitch i would say i was gonna pitch on a saturday and the the like six guys came into the room the i fought like my life depended on it and i i'm a pitcher and i like i remember afterwards i felt like i just went through a boxing match you know 12 rounds or something and i'm like how the fuck well first of all i I had to get hosed down like an elephant from the circus after that oh fucker wiped his ass on my face oh i fought like crazy but then i'm like now i have to pitch a game at 9 a.m tomorrow after just feeling like i'm i just got hit by a truck yeah and yeah, it's just one of those things where, you know, hey, boys will be boys kind of look the other way. But at the same time, you know, we were setting up this culture where it's creating this hierarchical system where, you know, mm. you, you were shamed during that point to become part of the group. There's a lot right. there that I mean, that, that I could do a whole fucking episode. I never talked about that until right now on the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was kind of the person that was like a reverse hazer. Meaning that I remember when we were in my youth retreat and some of us younger one, me and the two other buddies were the younger ones. We wanted, we wanted to get back at the pranksters. So those guys who always every year felt they needed to do something to the young, young youth group members. So they were at dinner and we put butter in their cereal, you know, peed in the shampoo, you know, we did all this stuff. And we just thought it was hilarious. And they found out, you know, and they had gotten the first two guys. And I remember one guy was crying, you know, my buddy was crying. And the other one, you know, he took his lumps too. And they, they came to me. I said, oh, it's my turn, huh? They go, yep. I was like, drop my pants completely naked. And I just started grabbing their hands, putting on my, my, my balls. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <"Dilly>, ah! <laughs> That'll do it. They, they took off. They took <laughs> off. That's it. That was my reverse haze. <laughs> I gotta somehow work that into the title of this episode. I don't know how how I'm gonna go about doing that. Like your hands on my balls. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. That's that's, a good, that's it. A little reverse. <laughs> I'll tell you what. That's the that's the character you should have brought down to the Arkansas principal. <laughs> You know what, motherfucker? I can't do Octavius the gay guy. Okay, Here's I'll what do I'm this. Do. <laughs> That's funny. That is great too. That would have been a great. <laughs> so I'll end it on. I'll end it on that note. The reverse hazing. So Mike <laughs> Fallon, tell us where people can uh, can find you. Can reach out to you. How do we get in contact? Yeah. So uh, best way through Mikey Fallon. M Y K E E F O W L I N dot com mikey found dot com and that's my instagram tag too as well as my uh facebook one is michael mikey fowlin and um so yeah those are the three ways and then if you need a book or anything like that tess and my assistant she'll take care of you uh through the website perfect and to find the map project now what we're working on collaboratively it's under mikey dot com you can find the information about the map project and how you could bring um, the group of the three of us into your school, into your organization um, to work with your, you know, specific needs, uh, school, you know, it could be coaching, yep. it could be any kind of, um, you know, facilitation around mental health and, and what we talked about today. So Mikey Fallon, thank you so much, brother. It's so good to see you. I'm so happy that, you know, we're kind of sharing this journey together. Um, appreciate you as always. And uh, we'll see you next time on Building Thanks. Men. All right. Thank you. Thank you.